Hello, everyone, and welcome to this fourth event from the Remixing the Classics Research Network. My name is Erin Sullivan, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the network, which is exploring how digital technologies are being used to remake classic literature and drama. I want to start by thanking our funders, the UK's Arts and Humanities Research Council, our partner, the Association of Adaptation Studies, my co-chair, Deborah Cartmel, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, our project assistant, assistant Beth Sherrick, who's working behind the scenes to make sure this call runs as smoothly as possible, and of course, our wonderful speakers who I'll be introducing shortly. Um, I wanted to say that uh, you're very welcome as audience members to, to engage with this event through the chat and eventually through the discussion. Um, so I can see that some people have already started putting some messages in the chat, which is lovely. Um, and if you'd like, you're very welcome to say hello and let us know where you're dialing in from, uh, from around the world. I'm here in Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK at my office at the Shakespeare Institute. Those of you who have been to previous events from Remixing the Classics will know that we've programmed a series of online seminars to explore what digital technologies bring artistically, pedagogically, and politically to the retelling of old stories. You can read more about the project on our website, and we'll put the link to that in the chat. Um, and you can also become a part of the network yourself by filling in the form. Again, we'll put the link for that in the chat. If you sign up for the network, you'll receive occasional emails about upcoming events and also recordings of past events. So speaking of which, we've just published the recording of our first event on video games and virtual worlds. You can find the link to this wonderful conversation again in the chat. And we hope to have the recordings of our other events available in the coming weeks. We're just working on improving the audio, audio captioning so that they're as inclusive as possible. As we approach the end of our online seminars, we'd like to take a minute to let you know about what's next for the network. In July on the 15th, it's a Friday, we'll be hosting a cross-professional workshop and networking event on digital adaptations in Birmingham in the UK, which will also be streamed online. It will be free to all, whether you come in person or attend online, and it'll focus on digital adaptations in the creative industries and in teaching practice. Our keynote speaker will be Sarah Ellis, Director of Digital Development at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And she'll be talking about what she and her team learned from their Audience of the Future project funded by Innovate UK. We're looking for creative practitioners and teachers in particular who might be interested in being part of two roundtable discussions at that event. So if you work on digital adaptations, if you're interested in creating them as an artist or interested in using them in your teaching practice, if you're a teacher at whatever level, we'd be interested, and if you'd be interested in coming to the event and talking, please let us know after this event um, through a short survey that will pop up. That survey is for everyone. It's a couple of questions about this event, its accessibility, what you found engaging, how it could be improved. But it also gives you the opportunity to indicate if you might be interested in being part of one of those roundtables. Finally, in August, we're hosting an online conference on digital adaptations and putting together a journal special issue on the topic. I'm going to turn over now to my co-chair, Deborah Cartmel, to tell you a little bit more about that. Hello, hello. I'm um, Deborah Cartmel, and uh, I'm Professor of English and uh, founder of the Association of Adaptation Studies. And I'm speaking to you from my unit from, from Leicester in the UK uh, right now. And it's it is a pleasure to come together today to talk about publishing, programming, and preserving digital adaptations. And thanks in advance to all the speakers and our funders, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. As part of the network, we will be publishing a special issue of the journal Adaptation, which is published by Oxford University Press. And submissions are, are open to everyone, and uh, you can access the journal uh, online. And we'll, we'll put the link in the chat. The deadline for submission is 1st of December, but you can submit any time. And the journal publishes E first. And if your work is accepted, it will be published around three weeks after your final um, acceptance. And Adaptation is the journal of the Association of Adaptation Studies, who are the project's partners. So anyone who has applied for funding recently will know that programming, publishing, and preserving work has become increasingly complex. And I'm really looking forward to what our speakers are going to say about this topic. 
Um, and we, we've been delighted at the level of engagement this network has generated. And uh, we're really excited to hear from you today. So I'll pass you back to Erin, who will introduce the speakers. Wonderful. Thank you, Deborah. So it's now my pleasure to turn our attention to today's seminar on publishing, programming, and preserving digital adaptations, and to welcome our wonderful trio of speakers who have generously agreed to share their thoughts and expertise with us today. Through this series, we've been exploring how digital technologies can connect classic literature and drama with new audiences. Today, we want to focus on both the opportunities and challenges from an industry point of view, when it comes to commissioning, presenting, and saving digital work. How do you archive a Twitter adaptation of a play by Chekhov, Ibsen, or Shakespeare, for instance, or produce and market a web project based on a Dickens novel or an Austen novel? How can you develop digital adaptations that will remain accessible, even as new technologies become old and online platforms come and go? And that's one of the big challenges with technology is new forms are constantly emerging, but they're also constantly becoming obsolete as they're replaced by you know, the next version, the next tool. As with our previous seminars, we'll begin with 10 minute presentations or talks from each of our speakers. And then we'll use the second half of the seminar for discussion. We hope that you, the audience, will get involved in that discussion. You can submit questions using the Q&A button in your Zoom toolbar, and that's, that's the easiest way for us to see your questions. Um, but you can also contribute comments and further thoughts in the chat. And if for any reason that Q&A button isn't working for you, we'll also look out in the chat for questions. Please remember, of course, to keep the discussion respectful. Deborah, Beth, and I will keep an eye on the Q&A and chat and draw on them when we get to the discussion portion of the seminar. But first, our speakers. Our first speaker is Margaret Bartley. She's editorial director at Bloomsbury Academic, where she's been involved in digital innovations, including developing an app version of Shakespeare's sonnets, which featured videos of actors such as Patrick Stewart, Kim Cattrall, and David Tennant performing the poems alongside its printed text. She's also worked intensively on Bloomsbury's digital platform, Drama Online, which features ebook versions of the press's scholarship on Shakespeare and other dramatists, as well as video recordings of the plays in performance. So we're very grateful to Margaret for coming to speak to us today, possibly about some of those past initi initiatives and perhaps about some of the things that Bloomsbury is looking forward to. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Um, can everyone see me all right? Is that all right? I'm, I'm on my way to screen sharing now. Um, give me one second. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, oh, that's the end of the presentation. So let's go right up to the end. That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> um, let me know if you can't see my first slide, which just introduces myself. So yes, I'm Margaret and I'm Editorial Director at Bloomsbury Academic. I thought I'd start by just telling you a bit about my publishing remit to give you an understanding of where I'm coming from in, in today's um, paper. So um, as well, I'm Editorial Director for three areas of our publishing here, for classics, by which we mean Latin and Greek in this context, drama and performance and literary studies. And within that role, I'm the editorial lead for Drama Online, our digital um, platform and library of play texts, video, audio, critical books, and more. And if you're not familiar with Drama Online, please do take a look and encourage your institution to subscribe, because I would say this, wouldn't I, but it's marvellous. Um, I'm also, and have been for a very long time, more than 20 years, the publisher of the Arden Shakespeare. Um, and I now focus on the play texts um, within that brand and, and a colleague works with me on the works of criticism. Um, as Erin said, I, I have in the past worked on a partnership where we did an, the Sonnets app with Faber and Faber and a Tempest app some years ago. I'm not going to talk too much about them today because to be honest, I don't have a huge amount to say about them. I didn't get involved in the technical side of things, but I will tell you that commercially, they weren't a great success and that in itself was interesting and that we joined those projects um, something, as something of an experiment really. Um, so in my role at Bloomsbury I've helped to develop Drama Online's functionality um, particularly around the display of Arden play editions in that digital space um, and now I'm working on the digital workflow and the design for the new Arden Shakespeare fourth series of editions which will launch in print and online in 2024. And I've included in this slide 
um, the other main imprint in our drama publishing um, of Matthew and Drama, which is a, a we are the, the biggest drama publisher now um, in the UK, if not everywhere. And the Matthew and Liz does have um, an awful lot of classic texts from Sophocles to Ibsen, right up to the 20th and 21st century, all of which, um, or almost all of which are included in drama online. So I thought I'd start by sharing some of the issues that we dealt with when moving existing art and Shakespeare play texts onto Drama Online and ahead of the platform's launch in 2013. It's almost 10 years old now, which is quite staggering. Um, just in case not everyone on the call is familiar with Arden editions, uh, they comprise a long 35,000 word introduction, which is roughly half a standard academic book in length, um, the play text itself, and two sets of on-page notes in the print editions. So textual notes, which collate the text history in print, and longer commentary notes intended to illuminate and illustrate the guide, the text, and to guide the reader's understanding. The Arden Third series of texts began publishing in 1995 and only completed in 2020. So the main challenge we faced when creating uh, the editions for Drama Online was basing a digital edition on a print one, for which in most cases we only held print-ready PDF files, which needed scanning, which um, caused all sorts of issues, as you might imagine. We also soon realized that the printed book is actually a brilliant technical device in itself. It offers the reader an index, of course, for exploring, but also the chance to navigate the book simply by flicking through its pages and stopping as something catches your eye. In the case of the Arden editions, the printed page displays all the information offered about a passage, some lines or a word at one glance on one page without the reader having to do anything more than drop their eye from where they're reading the text to the bottom of the page and back up again. So our challenge in moving our editions online was to capture and ideally enhance that reading experience. So we need to understand how our digital readers would approach the text, what they would want from the digital edition and how we might deliver it. And would that be very different from how they engaged with the print edition? This involved quite a few years of working obviously with developers, but also with academics and students with our, our market, with our customers, whilst also starting the process of establishing an XML schema that would deliver an online layout that retained all the features that make an Arden edition an Arden edition. And then there were all the special features unique to plays, stage directions, speech, speech prefixes. And of course, with Shakespeare and other early modern texts, there was the issue of handling verse and prose lines and shared lines and so many more complicated features of what can appear on the page, a simple text. So the process of converting our print files to digital and applying our TEI schema was complex and time consuming. And for some time we had um, a team member in place simply to manage the three or four rounds of editorial checks that went on on a, on a testing platform. And it took us quite a few years and it was some years after launch before we managed to get all of the Arden playtext live on the platform. But we really did want to um, make sure that, as I say, that the, the user experience was as good or better than the print. Um, we also in 2020 migrated the platform, which did allow us to make some changes to the layout, but perhaps not all the ones we would have ideally liked to, but there are always budgetary um, constraints, of course, in these things. So this is just a slide showing you how the playtext appears very simply within the Drama Online platform. Um, as you can see, it, it retains the print page numbers, which is very important actually for people who are using the digital alongside a print, which is what we're finding the majority of our users do. And at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that there are two little buttons, show line numbers and show notes. So unlike the print um, edition, the reader, the reader can choose whether or not to engage with the notes or whether just to read the play as cleanly as possible, which often is something that um, people wish to do. This next slide shows what happens if you click on um, show line numbers. In the grayed out, you'll see the line numbers appearing on the right. And then the show notes, so the notes are a pop-up. And that's currently how a text is appearing. Um, but we're now moving on from launch in 2013, and we are busy commissioning the next generation of Arden editions in the fourth series. 
So now we have the challenge of working out what the opportunity is to create a born digital Arden 4. We won't have to work backwards for a print edition that's been in print for 20 years or more. So now I think the challenge is less about rendering that print edition digitally and more about establishing what digital features are needed and will add real value and what other digital whistles and bells we could in fact live without. I often say to my colleagues here, we could do X, Y, and Z, but is that actually something that users want? Is it something that users need? And is it something we can afford? Obviously has to be another question in that mix. So again, that means working with our, with our readers, our students and researchers to understand how they want to use these editions and what they need them to do. And that usage has probably changed over the years in which Drama Online and other digital editions have been available to people. And we also need to work out what matters less to them. Um, because just because you can do something clever or something pretty digitally doesn't mean that it's actually useful. So another aspect of the born digital challenge uh, means working out who does what in that digital workflow. Some publishers, um, for example, have their academic editors apply all of the XML coding to their texts. But our view at Bloomsbury is that this it is more efficient and consistent if the majority of the XML schema is applied and managed in-house by our content architecture team. And that we ask our academic editors only to apply XML to certain features of their text, which require their expert knowledge. So for example, we in-house can apply XML to features such as stage directions, speech prefixes, but the academic editor may be the best place person to tag a particular nutty textual variant or to, to establish whether something is prose or verse. Again, the goal is to maintain and build on all that Arden print editions offer, and we will carry on publishing in print Arden 4 editions so that, we, again, we will offer our customers both print and digital side by side. Um, and yeah, we really, that really matters to us, I would say, more than anything, is keeping the, the brand values, the quality, the things that people value in our editions. That's our, that's our, our job, really. So alongside all these challenges, there are opportunities. And I think one of them is the potential to update editions um, as living editions on the platform, updating performance. Um, so we can see the editions more as living objects of study and research. In the past, art and editions stayed in print for 10, often over 20 years, with only the top selling texts allowing for updates or second editions. But now we will have the chance to update in the digital space more regularly. But we'll have to think through that very carefully because the print editions will also carry on existing, I think. Um, so that's something that is a challenge and an opportunity as these things always are. Um, I think the digital opportunity, the, the biggest one, and a platform such as Drama Online offers where the editions sit within a wider context of material and content is the opportunity for users to read and engage with the text um, in the context of critical books about it, in videos of performance, all in that same digital space. So the three images I've, I've pulled up here are an image from the RSC production of Love's Labours Lost, our current edition of Love's Labours, and a book in which there's a chapter all about Love's Labours, all of which would come up through the taxonomy in the search for a user. Um, and that's just something that's very hard to replicate elsewhere and, and within the pages of a book. And I think there's a real benefit to, for users to be kept within that same digital space while they're exploring and studying and researching. I think another opportunity is the increase in accessibility for students the world over for whom buying or accessing the print edition is difficult or impossible. And that's certainly true for Drama Online in terms of accessing um, theatre productions, but it's true of the texts as well. Um, and the functionality that the platform offers can also offer new ways of exploring a text. And I just quickly wanted to show you a very simple thing from our Play Tools feature. Um, I hope you can, you, I'm sure you can see the colours. This is our Play Tools word count um, feature. And here I've selected Juliet and Romeo from, from their play. Um, and what I love about this is that it shows you very quickly that Juliet has more words than Romeo, particularly, you can see the shift of balance through that slide, I think. And, I, and this was a, a feature we developed originally in Drama Online when we were thinking about um, performance. We were thinking about actors wanting to know how many words they had, creating their own part books. 
we weren't really thinking about a literary approach to the text. And I remember presenting this to one of the series editors for the Arden third series. And he, who was very digitally skeptic, and he said, goodness, that is just so, that, that there is a seminar, that is an essay. I can immediately see a new way into the play, just looking at you know, the balance of who says what and when. And so there's some unexpected opportunities have sort of emerged from some of the decisions we made early on, I think. Um, the functionality of the platform also allows for some degree of user customization. I showed you this, the slide where you can choose to engage with the notes or not. And as we move into Arden 4, we want to look at making some of those pop-up notes audio notes. So for example, let's say in a history play, it says trumpet flourishes. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could press the button and hear an appropriate trumpet flourish? Um, or if there was an object described um, in a play, the example I always use um, is that of a purse at the beginning of Othello, put money in my purse, put money in my purse. To an average American uh, undergrad, a purse is what in the UK we call a handbag, rather different. So wouldn't it be great if what, what could pop up was a little image of, of an Elizabethan or Jacobean coin purse? Um, so there are nice things we can do there about the notes. And what we really want to do is for users to be able to choose the level and amount of, note, of notes they see and still to give them the opportunity to read the play kind of clean, if you like, if that's their preference. And we're looking to have um, a new pop-up window as an option, which would sit alongside the text on the, uh, at the side of the screen, where the notes would be always visible, but would, and would scroll in sync as you work through the text. And that I think would be a real um, benefit to users. Also, as we add Arden 4 editions, they'll sit alongside the Arden 3 editions for comparison purposes, so that Drama Online starts to become its own archive, if you like, which I think is also um, a really interesting idea to explore. Um, and the other thing, obviously, that putting these editions into a bigger platform um, allows for is that the taxonomy that we've built around everything and the advanced search function increases discoverability across editions and other content. So here I've just pulled up the Arden 2 Dream and then we update, we put in the Arden 3 Dream and then we have multiple, but anyway, I've put in the Globe's um, slightly infamous production of A Midsummer Night's Dream um, as well. But all sorts of links can be made um, across the content through plays. And because the site actually has almost 4,000 playtexts in it now, most of which are 20th century and beyond, there can be some really interesting links made across time as well, I think. So a lot there um, that the digital rendering of texts has to offer. So just to be summarized, and I'm sorry if I've talked too long, I probably have, um, my lessons learned are that the opportunities do outweigh the challenges, although as you develop these, these products and you work on these texts, it can sometimes feel that the challenges are greater than the opportunities. Um, and so I've learned to be open to change and challenge. I mentioned that I've been publishing the Arden for 20 years and, you, and I knew I was very invested in the print edition. So learning to, to change and think differently about, about the text and how they might be accessed, listening to our authors, our advisors and our readers as much as possible and learning from them. And as part of that, keeping the reader's needs at the centre of everything we do, both in print and digitally. And I think coming out of the pandemic, as we all hope we are, I think it's also important to recognise and to reflect the new hybrid approach to reading, exploring, teaching and studying those texts. I think we're in a new phase now. Um, I firmly believe that print editions have a place to play, um, but I also think that this hybrid approach is, is, is obviously here to stay and that the digital is where some really interesting things can continue to be done. So I look forward to hearing people's questions later on, and I hope that was a helpful, if slightly whistle-stop overview. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so. I'm sure everyone has questions. Um, people can, if you'd like, to, you can go ahead and start formulating them. We'll save them up until the discussion session. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our second speaker, uh, who is Fiona Morris. Uh, she's Chief Executive and Creative Director of The Space, a digital agency founded by the BBC and Arts Council England to support digital innovation and audience engagement in the arts. She and her team at The Space help artists explore how digital technology can enhance their artistic work through new forms of making and also help them reach wider audiences through streaming and other forms of digital distribution. Some of their commissions based on classic texts have included Frankenstein, How to Make a Monster, A Christmas Carol, Binaurally, 
1927's Gollum, and the Northern Ballet's 1984. Thanks so much, Fiona, for being here. Indeed, hi, and uh, hello, good morning to the people who I know are joining, I think quite early in their day, and good afternoon to everybody else. I will just share my screen. Um, so get that one up there. There we go. So yes, um, as Erin said, we are um, an a, a digital agency. We're largely supported by the Arts Councils of the UK, but predominantly Arts Council England. And we were really set up to try and help cultural organisations and artists work out where digital might sit um, in kind of in new practice going forwards. And obviously, the last two and a half years have been a very challenging time that have seen lots of people experimenting uh, with publishing work online. Um, and I think there have been some new lessons learned, but I thought for purposes of today, what I would do is just go back through some of the work that we had commissioned from organizations of different classic texts, just to look at some of the key themes that I, I would suggest sort of people need to focus on. And the main one that I will say that I think sits across everything, any plan, any text, um, is to really consider audiences. Now that's something that many of you do all the time, but if you're talking about filming or interpreting work in a digital context and publishing it online, um, that search for an audience can be really, really hard. You know, the internet, one of my colleagues has a favorite saying about the fact that the internet is a place full of beautiful dreams that nobody ever visits. And it is really true that you have to really be incredibly forensic about deciding who you're trying to reach and what your message for them is and how and through what platforms and portals are you going to try and do that. So I just wanted to share a few pr projects that we've been involved in over the years. The first one I was going to mention is Talawa Theatre. Um, Talawa are committed to creating a more diverse representation on stage. They don't often do classic texts, but in this occasion they did work on a production, a brilliant production of King Lear. And what it did was to really switch any traditional views of casting around and cast all of the aristocratic noble roles, all the sort of in the hierarchy of the play to actually cast those roles um, with British black actors and then have kind of British white actors who were in, in other roles just to try and make a talking point when they were then taking that production out into schools, um, particularly with in areas of the UK where representation of classic texts, you know, for, for audiences, say, in Birmingham, where we're based, can feel very pale and white and not really true to many of the communities. So what they did with this was they made a film of it. We worked with them. We did work to get that shown on the BBC, which is great. It was shown um, as part of the Christmas schedule on Christmas Day, which I always felt was a slightly odd bit of scheduling for it. On the other hand, if you're going to have a story about a dysfunctional family, it may well be a good day to put it out as you sit there in your own family group, whatever that is. Um, but what they really did that I thought was incredibly impactful was to work with schools all around London and then another project project in the Midlands, actually taking the production out into local cinemas, taking some of the cast out with them and then having kind of Q&As afterwards with young audiences. And it was amazing the kind of conversations and discussions it began just by thinking about that issue around casting and then having something that was treated, you know, in a very immersive way on the screen and then being able to have that conversation. Um, it was also part of the Shakespeare Festival that the British Council supported. And so it was also then shown around the world and also entered into quite a few film festivals. The second uh, production that I thought I would pick out is the, um, the Don Mar Warehouse's uh, um, Philo de Lloyd Shakespeare trilogy, uh, which we worked on with them. That was very much aimed at capturing a work that Villada and the all-female cast there had been incredibly interested in looking at female communities, particularly within the prison service. And so the actual, all three plays are set as if they're being performed um, by inmates, uh, female inmates um, in a prison. 
and they took that production out and they did some of their R and D with within female prison communities in North America and in the UK. So again, having um, a version that they had captured digitally, and one of the really important things we did when filming that was to film it, it was staged in the round, so to film it really with cameras, making anyone watching it feel like they were in that very immersed experience of being inside a prison, watching something, so you had this really intense and very claustrophobic sort of feel to the production. Um, that went out on the BBC as well, but it also did a big tour into cinemas, both around the UK and around the world. It was shown again in some of those prison settings. It also had a really successful um, set of educational, um, sort of an educational package that ran alongside it to talk to students about the idea of what was in the playtext, how, how an all female production of it really allowed people to explore the text in a different way. Um, the third piece that I picked out was a production that we did with Bristol Old Vic, this company in the southwest of England, um, and this was working with them on a staged production of Handel's Oratorio the Messiah. It was a really interesting show in that they again had produced it to be seen in the round and they had also cast Jamie Bedard who's a wonderful British actor who suffers from cerebral palsy um, in, in the main role and it was incredibly interesting the debate that that then raised around accessibility, accessibility for disabled performers um, and this again was done as something where it went out on cinema, in cinema screens, there was an opportunity in quite a few of those settings to have a Q&A so that people could come and ask questions of the cast and the production team. Um, it did go out on broadcast, we got the BBC to show it later on. Bristol or Vic also put it out on their own online channels. But one of the really interesting things they did was at the very beginning, as soon as the show had been recorded, they then took the audio mix and cut that up into the different tracks of the different arias. And those went out on iTunes as individual tracks way ahead of the broadcast and the cinema screening. So it was a great way of getting people to kind of come into the space and know that the production was coming and worked very effectively. Um, then I wanted to highlight Cheek by Jail. Many of you will know Cheek by Jail's wonderful work and that it does have an incredibly international base to it uh, in, in how and when and where they stage productions. So with A Winter's Tale, again, one of the really interesting things there was that we formed or they formed a media partnership with Le Figaro and El Pais. And so when it was live streamed it, as an English speaking production in from the UK, it went out automatically with French subtitles and Spanish subtitles. So again, digital allows you that ability to speak to many people in different contexts and to reflect different kind of representation in the piece. But in this case, really simple one of just having those other subtitled versions available to go out on those streams. And again, did really, really well through both through both those outlets. Um, Erin mentioned, uh, so we worked this one already, we worked with Battersea Arts Centre uh, on their production of Frankenstein, Making a Monster. This is um, a, a young group, a youth group that work with Battersea called Beatbox Academy. Um, they're all beatboxers and they took Frankenstein as a school set text and transposed it into their kind of um, their spoken word adaptation so very much how they felt as an outsider how they felt within their communities how they felt they were seen so it was it was an adaptation beyond an adaptation but really effective and I know that we have worked with them on that being entered into lots of festivals but lots of young people who've seen it and I think it's helped them to kind of come back to the original text and see quite a different set of layers in there and um, was also broadcast uh, on the BBC. Uh, Christmas Carol, I think Dickens was mentioned early on, and we did a production of A Christmas Carol with Simon Callow um, some years ago, and that was interesting. I was really interested for us to work on something that was quite simple in terms of its visual setting, so it's Simon's one-man show of Christmas Carol, but to look at creating a binaural 
audio setting for it so it sits in a soundscape where you hear the sound of the uh, Simon as he performs moving just playing the character of Scrooge but also you get the kind of atmospherics of the setting as he moves backwards and forwards through time as he moves to different places geographically in the text um, and it's a wonderful listen as well as something to kind of sit and watch um, and that went out on BBC's R&D channel so where they could play the binaural out but it was also shown in cinemas with an adapted stereo uh, audio soundtrack to it um, and it has most recently been out on Amazon again allowing lots of different audiences to come to it in different contexts. And then finally, and I'm not going to spend long on this one because I know that you've got Sarah Ellis coming to talk at another uh, on another occasion, but I just wanted to mention Dream Life because I do think with binaural audio, looking at kind of new platforms, looking at new technologies and ways you can use them, I do think that Dream Life was a really good example of trying to challenge what an audience's ability to participate um, and have an, this kind of experience in an online or a cinematic or, or a live site specific context and I think when you hear more from Sarah you'll hear a lot about the experimentation involved in creating dream trying to come up with a way of actually creating a, a really immersive visual experience for an audience online of course their original intention was to do something live that people would have attended site specifically but the pandemic had other plans for everybody and I think it, it was an amazing and incredibly effective piece um, that's it. I will stop sharing, but thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Fiona. Um, we'll move swiftly on to our final speaker, Stella Wisdom, um, and then we'll go into questions. I saw that there was a question in the um, co uh, comments about whether people could voice their questions. If you're able to type them, that will work best. But if anyone has any accessibility needs where voicing would be preferable, um, we can look into that. So Stella is digital curator at the British Library. With her colleagues, she's worked on trying to figure out how to archive lots of different kinds of digital materials that can quickly become obsolete. She's also the co-founder of Off The Map, a video game competition which invites students to create new digital work based on classic texts and materials held in the British Library collections. Through that competition, students have created projects inspired by works like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Bram Stoker's Dracula, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, and Shakespeare's The Tempest, among others. Thanks so much, Stella, for being here. Thanks, Erin. That's great. Let me just share my screen. So is that all showing OK? Yes, it is. Thank you. Great. Right. Brilliant. So thanks for inviting me today. I'm going to um, talk about, um, I suppose, two categories of things, really. One is the creative collaborations using British Library collections, and, and the other is collecting what we call emerging formats. Um, so for those of you, I'm assuming many people in the audience probably know about the British Library and have probably visited our reading rooms. Um, for, for anyone not that familiar, um, the British Library is the National Library of the, the United Kingdom. And I just wanted to say really that we're a, more than just books. So we've got kind of vast collections. Um, we have kind of estimates that we have uh, probably 170 million items in the collection, but that um, is hard to kind of confirm because because the collections really are kind of very, very vast. Um, it includes the sound archive, um, the web archive, newspapers, maps, manuscripts, including Beatles lyrics, all sorts of things. Um, I just wanted to kind of show a picture of one of the inside of one of our kind of high density storage warehouses at our site in Yorkshire, because this kind of really does kind of convey the kind of scale of the of the collections that we've got in the library um, and when you kind of think of 746 kilometers of shelving it's kind of quite mind-boggling um, the size of the collections that we've got um, this provides some context for what, what I'm going to talk about. So the British Library's Digital Scholarship Department, which I'm um, part of, we were set up over 10 years ago, really to promote um, creative use of digital collections. Um, so kind of really opening up the library's digital collections, both the digitized analog collections and increasingly born digital collections for everyone who wants to kind of use our digital content data um, in their work, um, whether it's um, scholars um, or increasingly kind of creative 
professionals as well. So I um, instigated a competition called Off the Map. Um, so this was a competition for higher education um, students um, to create video games using British Library digital collections. It was a way for the library to engage with new audiences. And it also, it was an opportunity for students to showcase their talents to industry. Um, I was inspired by this because at a conference, um, someone showed me a YouTube clip of a digital Roslyn Chapel. So people probably know this from the Da Vinci Code um, or people might, might have visited this but it was a really amazing kind of um, digital reconstruction of the building and I was kind of blown away when I was shown this and and so um, Ian Simons and James Newman who co-founded the National Video Game Museum they, they were saying could we use British Library collections to do a competition inviting students um, to, to kind of use collections to do something like this reconstruction of Roslyn Chapel. So that's when we found it off the map. Um, for the first competition, this wasn't a literary adaptation. We picked, um, I worked with my colleague Tom Harper, um, curator of antiquarian mapping, and one of the themes that we picked was London in the 17th century before the Great Fire of London. Um, and we picked out items like this um, view that you can see. So this is kind of um, London Bridge, um, the original London Bridge before it, it kind of moved. Um, you can see the heads on the spikes, there's a lot of detail in this image. And maps like this, which this shows um, the area that was kind of destroyed um, in the Great Fire of London. And you can see in the cartouche at the top, London ablaze. So it's kind of a vast area. Um, to cut things short, the winning entry, Pudding Lane Productions, did an amazing kind of um, virtual reconstruction of, of London before the Great Fire. Um, and I'm not, I've not got time to show a clip now, but I've just shown um, a link to the YouTube kind of um, fly through. But it was really um, amazing. Um, it was very detailed. It, it, it was a large explorable area um, and it got some press attention and it was featured on BBC Click and in, in some national newspapers. So I was allowed to run the competition again. Um, but then in other years, I tied it into British Library exhibitions. So the first competition wasn't um, tied into any exhibitions, but the following ones were. Um, we did one um, linked to our Gothic literature um, exhibition um, and we and we provided content um, about Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death um, and Whitby with its connections to Dracula, but also um, views and illustrations of Font Hill Abbey, um, which doesn't even exist as a ruin anymore. So this was home of author William Beckford. Um, and um, like I say, this was a preposterous building. It fell down twice because of this central tower that was kind of structurally unsound. Nothing exists of this site in reality anymore. Um, but the winning team that year, they did um, a game um, for um, Oculus Rift, um, where you went hunting glowing orbs. And each time you found a glowing orb called a Nyx, you rebuilt part of Font Hill Abbey, and then you could go exploring the interior. So, so kind of um, really, really kind of interesting. And they set it underwater. So, so virtual reality has often got a criticism. It can make people feel seasick, um, but they kind of built that in as part of their kind of gameplay. Um, so, so you're kind of swimming around in an underwater environment um, and rebuilding part of Font Hill. Um, following on from that, and this is, I suppose, where we get more onto the kind of literary adaptations, which is more relevant to, to the kind of topic of this talk, we had an Alice in Wonderland off the map. Um, so, so the Lewis Carroll manuscripts are one of the British Library's treasures, um, where Lewis Carroll did did the illustrations um, in these manuscripts himself before before the Tenniel, um illustrations that are famous from the publications. Um, so we provided all sorts of content, um, including kind of views of Oxford um, and also underground environments and, and natural sound effects. So, so we, we started to realize that students wanted to kind of build um, sound into their games as well. And the winning entry for, from this year, The Wandering Lands of Alice was, was really inventive because you can see on this image, they actually used um, kind of digitized items to form the, the kind of the story world of their game and you can you can see um, the, the kind of the rabbit here running across pages of a manuscript and the kind of spines of the books forming towers and I think I will if I've got time I will just show a little bit of this of this game
So I hope that gives a kind of um, a flavour. Um, so this was, this was created by students from, from De Montfort University in Leicester. And we actually had a, a playable version of this game in the Alice exhibition, which was the first time that we'd had kind of a playable video game on display. So exciting for me. Um, following from Alice, we had um, a Shakespeare off the map um, linked into our exhibition that was co commemorating the 400 years since the death of, of Shakespeare. Um, we, we kind of drew upon A Midsummer Night's Dream and, and The Tempest um, for this one. And you can see a map um, of Bermuda here where there'd been a famous kind of ship shipwreck in Shakespeare's time and that was said to influence um, the Tempest so um, I'm not I've not got time to show a clip of, of their game but it's um, the winning entry um, again from De Montfort University they won two years in a row um, there um, but really kind of interesting interpretation of this I also wanted to flag up a runner-up for that year because there was an entry um, a retelling of A Midsummer Night's Dream by Tom Batty from London um, College of Communication. And this was kind of really interesting. He had written alternative dialogue for the characters and you could bewitch and unbewitch the characters and have completely different kind of um, alternative dialogue um, with this method in this work as well. In fact, you can see on the on this screenshot, it, it kind of digitally cut out um, the characters from kind of engravings that were provided as, as kind of digitized assets um, to make the game. And the environment were, was a generating kind of woodland where pages, um, so kind of pages of text formed the trees and bushes. So this is still available as a, as a kind of free download game. So if, if anyone's keen, please do check that out. I'm gonna move swiftly swiftly on um, and I appreciate Andrew Byrne from University College London has already presented in this series earlier but the British Library partnered with with UCL on mission maker projects including Beowulf um, so so the Beowulf manuscript is also one of our treasures um, and this is a kind of game creation software that that they've developed that allows um, young people in the classroom or, or kind of other events for young people to make their own um, video games um, about the Beowulf um, tale um, and people can read more about this in kind of Andrew Burns book that that was published last year. Um, I, I got involved in a couple of these kind of educational games projects using kind of literary um, archival collections so from kind of, from working on Mission Maker um, I collaborated with um, Lancaster University on LitCraft so this uses the Minecraft platform um, to build literary environment um, environments of literary islands um, and this is, is to kind of engage children with um, literature um, it's not to replace reading the book you, um, the children have to read the books and then they do activities in Minecraft um, to reinforce their learning so they've built a number of these literary islands I'll just show one example here so we've got um, Kensuke's Kingdom um, you can see an overview of the Minecraft build um, and the map from the book of the island um, and this 
kind of shows there's different activities for the young people to complete um and and these are in game and and in in this world you open um the boxes and and go on different quests um and there's also kind of in game um a kind of books to read with with instructions for activities so so we're hoping to develop this project further um but it's it's worked well we've had um children from local schools come into the british library to do lit craft activities which is a great way to engage with learning um i appreciate time is moving on i'm going to race really quickly through um off the map was for um, students and, and lit craft is for school groups. Um, I got increasingly interested in how to open up activities for wider um, participation. So I ran a couple of online game jams. The first was an Odyssey jam in 2017, um, and the games are available on itch.io. So itch.io is a platform often used via for game jams. This was this was of interest. So we we did it for um, the anniversary of Frankenstein we had a gothic novel jam so I did a gothic off the map and then we did a gothic novel jam um, a couple of years later this this had really good kind of international participation and I was very pleased that it got over 40 entries um, from from all across the world and again these games are, are free to play from the itch.io site um, this started inspiring other libraries to run their own game jams and last year um, Leeds libraries did a novels that shaped our world um, 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 jam um, linked to the kind of the BBC list um, and they had entries I was really interested in the kind of Orwell in, in inspired entry but again Frankenstein and Alice in Wonderland was popular so these kind of works seem to be um, kind of have kind of I suppose it's the kind of um, appeal to be turned into into kind of playful um, adaptations um, so with, with all these kind of creative projects, the learning projects, the game jams, the student competition, in the library, we've been increasingly interested in the last few years of how to collect um, digital works. And we've done this under our emerging formats um, project. This is with the other legal deposit libraries in the UK. So we've had legal deposit legislation for a long time, um, since 1662. But in 2013, it was updated to become digital legal deposit. Um, and thus this includes um, kind of being able to collect um, digital publications um, and we're, we're kind of increasingly interested in what we call emerging formats. So this, this is kind of complex digital, we sometimes refer it to. So works whose content and structure are more challenging um, compared to those being currently collected. It's, it's sometimes difficult to articulate this. Um, so in simple terms, um, we, we've been looking at things, works which we define as books as mobile apps and web-based interactive narratives. Um, and we, to collect these, um, this can be done in kind of agreement with publishers and, and collaborating with publishers, um, sometimes maybe downloading with an access code. Um, but for works that are available on the kind of open public web, we can do this via kind of web, har web harvesting um, and part of our web archiving work in the libraries. So an example of a, of a work as a mobile narrative app is 80 Days by Inkle Studios. So this is a kind of retelling of um, Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days. Um, the writer Meg J. Anth has told this story from Passepartout's perspective. Um, it's a really interesting work and it's won awards. Um, Inkle have been amazingly helpful in helping the library understand how to collect these works and we've um, they've they've provided their source code and different versions of the app. So so that's good. I've just put in a photo from a British Library event where people came cosplayed as as, as Phileas Fogg and Passepartout because I love this. I love it when people kind of cosplay um, for library events. Um, for collecting web-based um, interactive narratives, Linda Clark um, was a postdoctoral researcher working with the library on a six-month placement um, um, just before COVID, um, and she built an interactive narratives collection in the UK web archive, and she experimented with different types of um, crawlers. So, so Heratrix is our main web archive crawler, which we use for the annual crawl, but it's not always very good for kind of capturing interactive content. So she's experimented with um, a tool that was called Web Recorder, but it's now called Conifer. I won't go into the details of this, um, but this was the first time that we'd kind of experimented with um, these crawlers. Um, 
I wanted to give an example of, of work that was in, included in this collection that's still available and it's online, people can play. Um, so again, um, going back to kind of Alice in Wonderland, um, I wanted to kind of flag up a work called Down the Rabbit Hole. And this is um, a work about um, Alice's um, sister. So, so um, if anyone's interested, we're also um, looking at collecting digital content that um, is description as a collection method. So if we're struggling to capture um, playable versions of a work themselves, it's like, what else can we collect? And this can include press kits, um, interviews with authors, um, trailers, um, video playthroughs of a work. So, so we're, we're kind of hoping to make much progress with this kind of approach. And we'll, we'll be having um, PhD placement student later in the year, um, looking at this in detail. Um, yeah, so so web archiving is ongoing work. Um, if um, if anyone here wants to nominate websites that we should archive, we've got um, a form on the UK web archive site so people can nominate sites to be um, captured by the UK web archive. So we're always looking for people to make suggestions to this. Um, and that's me. So sorry, that was a very quick um, kind of romp through of, of things, but happy for any questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stella. Well, we'll move into questions now and people again should feel free to put questions through um, through uh, to us. I'll start uh, with a couple of questions for Margaret. We have a few. I'll take the first two of them. Um, one is from Lucy who asks Margaret, um, she says, Lucy Hobbs here from De Montfort University. I'd love to hear something of how you are future proofing the Arden Digital Fourth Editions um, to give them longevity in an ever changing technical context. And then there's a Further question from Peter Lewis, also from De Montfort, asking what functionality is there to add your own notes, mark the text, et cetera? Um, can that functionality be, or is there a functionality that allows these to be searched um, or to be backed up for security purposes? Uh, I'll answer that last question first, because the answer is yes, basically, Peter. <laughs> um, yes, you can bookmark and highlight text and drum online, and you can save it and you can share it. Um, with your fellow users at your, your institution, for example. So the, the basic answer to that is yes, um, but I'm, I'm sure we could enhance it and do more with it. And if you've got thoughts about that, please do email me. I, I'm very happy to hear from people um, because yeah, it's. I think our platforms are always developing even as they're live, but to go to the other question about future-proofing, I think one thing I've learned is that it's, it's pretty hard to future-proof uh, when things are changing. But so what we tend to do is instead of thinking of like development updates, plan them ahead. I suppose the model from a publishing perspective would be a new edition of a book every few years. Maybe that's the same thing for a platform. Um, and as I, and it suddenly really dawned on me actually as I was writing my notes for today that and talk, thinking about the opportunity to update editions as a live archive, um, but then what do you do with the print? So it's a kind of challenge that dawned on me on the train this morning. Um, so yeah, I don't know how much we can future-proof them. I think being open to adapting and changing them and, and seeing them as living objects might be a better way of approaching it, to be honest, if that is some sort of answer and not a cop-out. Thank you. And I wonder actually if I could um, invoke Stella a little bit here. I mean, Stella, I'm guessing with what you were talking about at the end of your presentation, you all are thinking from the kind of collections end about future-proofing or preserving for the future. Are there any, I don't know if you have any tips, are there things that people have done that make things more collectible or future-proofed or, or is it just impossible? Oh. This is very, very difficult. I mean, we've been having lots of discussion about Adobe Flash. So, so for folks who don't know, Adobe kind of um, stopped supporting Flash and lots of Flash-based works were suddenly not working. Um, that there, there are kind of people in the digital preservation community kind of working on this. In terms of making things future-proof, it's really, really hard because obviously kind of, um, software development moves moves at a much greater pace than the digital preservation community. All I can urge is for publishers and creators, I suppose, to think about digital preservation when they're developing new works and to maybe communicate with kind of archives or, or their own archives if they've got them in their own institution to kind of think about how may, maybe these works could be archived and building that into the development. Because if, it, if it's thought about at a development phase, it's then much easier than as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And certainly once services have switched off, trying to then go and, I'm, I almost call this digital archaeology, trying to then rebuild something to preserve it, gets very, very complicated indeed. Um, what I will say now is um, 
quite a lot of works for for use on kind of smartphones and tablets building them to work in kind of browsers so they're browser-based works rather than a standalone app um, that can be helpful because there are kind of like say crawlers and technologies in place for web archiving whereas collecting actually kind of standalone apps is a much kind of more complicated task but there's no easy quick answer other than if anyone is building or creating these works, if they can maybe talk to archivists and digital preservation folks and think about how to collect these works. Margaret, I know you mentioned the kind of touch press apps and the, the kind of, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, we, these are interesting. It's, it's like these kind of early experiments, even though they're not supported or they, they kind of vanish, they are really interesting to anyone kind of interested in, in this kind of phase that we're going through, the kind of, I suppose, history of publishing and kind of early digital experiments. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I've, I've got a PhD student who has, has got, an, got an iPad that he doesn't dare update or almost He's kind of, yeah, that's got these kind of early apps um, that, that he's kind of scared of, of updating, because, but, but then these, these works do start breaking and functionality starts um, yeah. and, you, and it's, it's, it's very difficult. It's yeah. a great shame the touch press apps just to chip in there was because the first one that, that we weren't involved with but touch press did um the wasteland it was it was brilliant it was brilliant they're, re they're relaunching it this year they've done an oh. updated version oh, well, yeah no so so so, 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 so um, there should be a revamped version of the wasteland out this year so yeah. watch, watch for it yeah because it, it was it was an amazing thing and then the sonnets came on the back of it and that also was amazing and and and, and that was quite interesting to work on because we but we just gave them our text we just provided the text on that so that's why I didn't really feel I could talk about it because I wasn't actually that involved other than knowing that it didn't really it didn't really sell and it was a commercial product so yeah that's that's what I was just going to add I, th I think it has been difficult to monetize a lot of this mm. um so um, not an adaptation, but I was interested in Penguin Random House's experiment with Fail Better Games, a project called the Black Crown Project. Um, they tried to monetize that and, and they struggled. So it only lived for a year um, and then it was switched off and we, we didn't manage to archive that work. But um, it, try, trying to find a kind of business model to make profit from these works mm -hmm. is, is, has been a challenge. But I, but I still think it's it, if any of these works can be preserved and archived because they are kind of early experiments and I'm sure in the future they will be kind of successful monetized versions of, of these types of products in publishing in the games mm -hmm. industry I mean 80, 80 days has sold well and has been a success for Inkle so so I'm sometimes wondering um, kind of maybe can kind of traditional publishing learn learn quite a bit from the games industry and and yeah, it's it's a complicated field. I I'll just move on to another question from Margaret. Um, thank you everyone for your presentations. They're absolutely stunning. Um, thinking of this is from Peter Lewis again, thinking about reviews of your audio editions in academic journals, have any reviews been written for the digital versions, which would uh, need to just to focus on the technical functionality as well as the content of the print version? That's interesting that the what tends to happen is that the whole drum online has been reviewed as a platform and I, I suspect that what happens is um, that the the Arden editions and the other that sit within it get to some extent get don't get a really forensic look so I, I am not aware of any detailed reviews and I know that our current rendering is it is imperfect these things always are well maybe they're not always but there are there are things we can do to improve but no there hasn't been I haven't certainly I haven't seen one um, I've seen very good reviews of the whole platform and elements of it, but nothing that really focuses on on those particular editions. Great, thanks. That's, that's, that's interesting. Maybe we should have uh, some reviews coming through. On, uh, yeah, on maybe. That'd be great. Um, I'll pass you back to Erin, and uh, I've, done, I've tried to type some questions in my notes myself, so uh, back to Erin. Wonderful, thank you. Actually, I have a question for Fiona, if I could bring you into the conversation. I know at the space, Fiona, you all publish, or you not just publish, you you commission and present a wide range of work, and much of it is new work, original devised work. And I wondered, this is a very broad question, but I wondered if with work that is original and new versus work that maybe has a classic text at its core or is a spin-off from it, do you feel like there are any um, particular considerations that that kind of come with works that have that classic element? Or are the, is every work in its own way a new work and they're all dealing with the same challenges of reaching audiences and things like that? 
Well, I think they're all dealing with some really common challenges, just that, you know, particularly publishing on your own, um, on your own channels online, you know, it, it's a very chaotic, uh, volatile space out there online. And, um, you know, you, you can choose a publication date, you know, and then have, you know, a civil servant publishing the report into something and that's it, you know, the, everything online is is moving towards one story that day and and all of your efforts can can go to naught. But but I think one of the things that we would do with any of the newly commissioned organisations, the very first thing that we do is to actually spend time with them to work on an audience development plan and marketing. And that is often about just getting them to think about partnership, um, think about where they can do one of the earliest projects that I was involved in um, at the space was uh, Teatro Complicite's production of The Encounter, um, which had been an amazing binaural experience live. And then we did a live stream of it with the with the company and we got them to just do a list of any and all of their significant partner organizations, venues, other creative artists in other contexts, other product, you know, other theater companies. And, and then what we, we suggested they did was to give all of them very short form assets. They were filming at lots of the performances. People will know kind of complicity have quite a kind of celebrity following. So there were very few performances that didn't have some quite famous faces at them. So they just had little sound bites of Benedict um, Cumberbatch and, and other people just saying amazing. And so those little sh short 20 second um, marketing clips were sent to all of the partner organizations. Um, they, those, they put those on their websites, plus a hyperlink with a countdown clock to the start of the live stream. And it was an amazingly effective thing because, you know, before they did it, it was really unusual thing. People hadn't done it and people were trying to give them estimates of, of audience numbers. And it was sort of said that if they got between two and four thousand um, people viewing, that would be amazing. You know, in the end, they got nearly 70,000 around the world and it had been so targeted at the UK, but had this extraordinary reach in the US where none of the marketing assets had been aimed at. There were nearly 20,000 viewers in in the United States and then there were about 7,000 viewers in Australia which absolutely meant that within two weeks of the live stream they'd been contacted by producers on Broadway and uh, and in and in Australia to take the show and say listen if you can reach that, those kind of audience numbers without any marketing directed in in the geographic area um yeah of course I'm going to book the show and, and and they did so so I think a lot of that sort of really thinking about who else can help you promote but obviously yeah title is incredibly important you know that kind of marketing of people feeling familiar you can see it with NT Live you know the pieces that have gone into the cinema you know there's a direct correlation between audience numbers in cinema for those live event pieces between familiarity of title definitely casting um, and where they've gone slightly more off piste um, I can remember they did an early piece with DV8 you know and they it just didn't work it just didn't land because those cinema audiences are used to having very targeted marketing effort going at them for anything new so so yeah I think sometimes yeah title is is really the lead thing but on the other hand you know if you really know your audience that's what I'm saying you know who you're going to trying to reach we did something with a, a, a women's theatre company in Newcastle doing pieces that look very much at the kind of female experience within the prison community. And, and we did a piece with them called Key Change, which was actually um, about experience, testimonial experiences of women within the prison service. And, um, and they put that out with support from the UN on Action Against Violence Against Women Day and got, you know, 30,000 people looking at that and have immediately picked up all sorts of other opportunities, including, in fact, working with the local police force in the north of England to create some testimonial based role playing for to help young kind of trainee officers deal with um, recognizing domestic abuse and substance abuse issues. Um, so yeah, so I think there are ways, but it's always, always, it's about targeting audience and knowing that in, in advance who you're trying to reach. That's really interesting. Thank you. Well, well I've got you, Fiona. Oh, well, Deborah, I was going to read your question. So would you like to sort of pose it? Sure. I just, uh, well, I've got Fiona here. I, I was just uh, amazed with some of the productions you were showing us and I just wanted to watch them. And I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, once the production's reached its kind of its uh, 
it had its run, so to speak. What happens to them? Um, is there any ambition to make them permanently openly accessible? Yeah, I mean, we again, it's a thing that we'll talk to organisations because we commission, but we don't own. So we work with them on their distribution plans and they and where they want to present. Um, and then they own the entirety of, of the work. So the digital work is theirs. And we will talk to them a lot about, yes, when there are opportunities, obviously, to to bring them, because a lot of these classic texts are kind of evergreen, but you don't want to just leave them on the Internet somewhere where they can just become a little tired. And, you know, so so I think we would always say look at a, at a first window strategy and if it's broadcast then obviously that means you're going to have to let the broadcaster have they have quite long periods of time where they'll say they have their transmission rights and then there's a quite a long window afterwards where you're not allowed to do very much else with it but we always try and negotiate that that's limited just to so if it's the BBC we'll say fine in the UK but the the organization need to have the ability to present this work outside of the UK um, on for you know, kind of on video on demand or DVD or cinema. So that's that's a big part of it. But then it's looking for opportunities. You know, when's the next? Is there an anniversary? Is there another reason? Is there a grouping of pieces? Because again, it's all about how do you market to audiences? How do you let them know that something is there? But we would always recommend that companies yeah keep keep those things and have them on their own platforms and make them available or work with someone like Digital Theatre to make sure they're available to schools and academic institutions. That's great. Thanks a lot. Um, pass you back to Erin. Erin, you're mute. Yes, sorry, it didn't click. I see in the chat, thank you, Deborah, that we have a question from Zolt Almasi, um, and he says, thank you very much for the inspiring presentations. A question for Margaret Bartley. Um, on one of your slides related to the Arden Four, there's been a reference to, quote, the user slash reader. Um, could you elaborate on the distinction uh, from a practical point of view? And then who is your target audience, the user or the reader? And maybe this is a broader question about what do we call audiences for digital works? You know, if we're talking about print, you know, kind of text-based works, or maybe if, depending, Fiona and Stella, if you want to chip in later, you know, audiences watching things online or playing games, is user a catch-all word or does that have different connotations? That's a really interesting um, question, and you've probably caught me out on using. I think it's partly a part of my education. I was saying that I was very, you know, aware that I was embedded in print and um just because of my long career in print publishing, I think I try and say user more, but sometimes I slip and say reader. But actually, you're reading on screen. I think that's it's a really it, it goes to the crux, doesn't it? Because I, I've done focus groups with students, for example, who who would use drama online, the text on drama online, to check references, to navigate a play, to find their way around, but not to do what, what you might call immersive reading. And if they wanted to read <laughs> as an activity, they would turn to print. Um, so that's why I think the hybrid model is, is here to stay. Um, but what, yes, and then of course, within the platform like Drama Online, you might be listening to an audio play, you might be watching a performance. Um, Lots of verbs are available and, and lots of nouns to describe those. So, yeah, I don't, I don't have a clear, coherent answer, as you can tell, but I think the difference is the nature of engagement with the text at the moment in which you're engaging with it, maybe, if that makes sense. Um, if you're using a text to find something specific or to make a connection between different texts or, or if you're just reading, um, then, then you're, yeah. No, not very clear, but that, that's what I think I mean. And I think it, it's it's obvious in my rambling that I need to, we need to think about that more closely and engage with our readers and users who are the same people. It's just the same person doing different things. Our target audience is anyone studying or teaching uh, a play in drama online or in the case of art and a Shakespeare play, is anyone engaging with the text? Um, I would say it's in an educational you know, we're an academic publisher and we sell our texts mostly to people who are studying and learning and researching and performing um, rather than just sitting on a bus reading Shakespeare but actually people who want to read a play on a bus will also buy an Arden text I think. I chip in 
in in the library traditionally we call we call everyone readers so so for I know everything's readers but then when I'm working with kind of games companies or game studios it's like they, they refer to players and I've been having exactly this these same debates with my colleagues internally it's it's do we call someone a reader do we call them a user do we call them a player it, it's it, it is very difficult because if I suppose if there's kind of um interactive participation and and it's multimedia content it sometimes feel that reader doesn't quite capture the experience um but at the same time we don't want to separate the work we're doing with the with this kind of content to make it seem very other from the rest of the collections because we're kind of seeing that kind of the born digital and interactive collections will become more business as usual and more standard over the time and what might be experimental at the moment might just be a transition phase so I don't have an answer either but all, all I know is I really really struggle to know um, yeah if anyone's got any great answers to this that can help Margaret and I out we are all ears I think <laughs> Wonderful. Fiona, did you have something to add as well? Yeah, I was just saying, I think, I mean, obviously we're talking, I will tend to talk quite a lot about audiences um, uh, or, or viewers. And definitely the one thing that we'll talk to organisations and always say is when you're publishing online, it's not passive. You need to consider how there's an element of interactivity and dialogue because someone's making choices from everything else and everywhere else they could be. But there's also something about wanting it to be a two way street so that it is much more um, actually for organizations it's like you're going to have to do a lot more work in this context because actually people want to be heard and seen if they're not physically in a space with you they want to be heard and seen so there needs to be an opportunity for them to be able to comment and and to get a response so yeah I think interactivity is, is the big shift online that's really interesting thank you and I was just going to note that I can see in the chat um, Alice Bell, Gemma Allred have chipped in kind of thinking about the, these different words and and the slashes that we put between them, which maybe reflects that the hybrid sort of phase we're in um, in really interesting ways. So thank you for that. And I'll turn over to Deborah for the next question. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to um, ask my own question if that's all right. I see we've got one in the Q&A, but I just wanted a question for Stella because I'm just, uh, I'm just amazed at the, the quality of the material that you're showing. And, um, I just wanted to ask you about quality control, um, anticipating a huge explosion of material coming your way. How do you, how do you manage it physically? Um, I'd be really interested to find out. That is a good question. With the web archiving, we're actually quite interested in, um, I, I suppose, kind of um, amateur people making works for fun. So it's not with, with a lot of interactive narratives, not a not um, there's there's kind of very active kind of communities and same same with the game jams of, of kind of I suppose hobbyist game makers um, and we we are in the web archive certainly we are interested in collecting um, these types of experimental works as well as kind of works that are made by professional studios and, and, and publishers. So this kind of like hobbyist making with, with the web archive, I, I suppose I should say we do like an, an, an annual crawl of the UK web. And, and so with this kind of annual crawl, it really is kind of less of the kind of selective web archiving um, and, and re really kind of trying to get kind of bulk. But in terms of quality control of that, we're thinking of like quality control of the playable captures. So we've had um, a PhD placement student um, in recent months looking at the quality control, not so much of, of the material, but the quality control of the actual captures themselves um, and how accurately they play back and, and they work. And, and Tegan's written um, a technical report that we'll be sharing on our repository with with kind of um, apps and other works, we are kind of kind of selecting these at the moment to do some experiments. Um, and so it is kind of curators choosing these works. So, so with the example I gave, it, it's like we made a curatorial decision um, to collect eight, 80 days and, and we've been kind of looking at, at, at kind of other works that we want to do. But you're right, with a kind of an explosion and with so much out there, it, it's kind of how do you choose what to select? Um, one of our kind of... Um, limitations might be the wrong work because we're doing this under UK legal deposit legislation it's we're looking for works that we're, where say 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 the publisher the writer it, it's kind of 
seen as a UK work, but as we've already discussed with kind of global projects and collaborations, defining what is a UK publication gets increasingly complicated, um, especially if, if you've had kind of a team where maybe the writer's based in the UK, but they might have development staff working on the project in another country. So it's, yeah, I, sp I think I have more kind of questions than answers on this, really. Um, but yeah, we are interested in kind of hobbyist and amateur games, um, works made in, in Twine and Bitsy, if people here are interested in kind of these kind of free tools that people often use in, in game jams. That's great. Thanks so much, Stella. I'll push back to Aaron. Wonderful. So we have a question from Ben Broadrib for Margaret. And Margaret, Ben says that he's a fan of Arden's performance editions with screen performance, not only firmly established in film and television, but evolving through digital adaptation and experimentation. Um, and with plays like Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet having a rich history in performance on screens as much as they do on stage. And the question is, do you think Arden would consider a series of play text editions particularly focused on the ways plays have been adapted on screens or through technological platforms. So I guess it's thinking about performance in this wider sense. Yeah, what an interesting idea. I think we think about it, quite how you render it in print. Um, the performance decisions themselves, I'm glad you're a fan, thank you. Um, they were quite a nightmare to tear practically um, because just because the notes, uh, for those who don't know, it's a, it's a sort of sub-series, not a sub, a parallel series, I should say, of art and editions where the notes are not at the foot of the page, as I described earlier, but they are facing page and they are the idea being that you're in rehearsal um, and your eye just has to glance across as an actor to the note that tells you what a word means or how the rhythm works or whatever, or how you pronounce something. Um, anyway, so they were very difficult to align. So if you're trying to capture more information even than that, which I think is what you're describing, um, yeah, it's a challenge. I, I'm interested in the idea, by all means, get in touch. Um, I'd, I'd love to see what that might what, what that might look like. Um, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And actually, Margaret, um, let's see, uh, Deborah popped an, a follow up question into the chat for you, which is saying it's fascinating how you're uh, expanding the concept of notes, Margaret. And it sounds like, as you're saying, Margaret, that opens up all kinds of challenges about where to put them, how to make them visible or audible. Um, Deborah asks, how do you limit the amount of material you use? Well, that's why the book is a wonderful thing, um, Deborah, because the book limits you immediately <laughs> because you only have so much space on a page. And, and that, that I think certainly the book is a marvelous innovation. But I think, um, I think, yeah, I, I can't start that question of what do you, what, what's, what can, it's come back to your user, your reader user. Um, what do they what do they want how much information in a pop-up for example is is readable is digestible is helpful you, you, as I said you, you can there's a lot you can do it doesn't mean that you should do it so I think it's a question of really being in, in touch with the way your content is being used and and and, and honing everything to that as much as you can um, yeah which is a very boringly prosaic answer but that's how we do it I would say that's great. Thank you so much. Well, Deborah, shall I pass over to you for what might be the last question? Because we're getting close to the top of the hour. Yeah, there's a question from Kate here in the QA. Um, I'm a big fan of digital adaptations, the Lizzie Bennett Diaries and Edgar Allan Poe's Murder Mystery Dinner Party. Both were released five plus years ago, and it appears they still have an academic audience. But the regular person audience has moved on, probably due to lack of user interaction with an active community on social media platforms. I think this is for everyone. Have you observed this or have do you have strategies to address this kind of drop off? Um, so I, I think I'll pass that on to, um, to, to, uh, to, to Stella and then to uh, Fiona. Yeah, this is a good point with, I suppose, I suppose with some works that had kind of like maybe regular releases of content or a kind of social media element to a work, it's like, so whilst they're kind of live, you're going to have that audience, but then if you're not drip feeding it content, it will become almost like a kind of mothballed work. Um, don't know what the answer to this, it, it, I suppose it's, I suppose from a kind of, I guess this is up to the publisher or the writers whether they want an ongoing audience um, and maybe even kind of cultivating forums for fans to communicate so Fallen London which is a game um, 
a kind of gothic victorian online game by by fail better they have like active community forums and and kind of big kind of like fan writing communities to kind of encourage kind of regular kind of community engagement with their fans but I think I suppose it's like the creator or the publishers need to decide whether they want that kind of regular engagement um, or not or whether something's like a live but but kind of almost like as a instead of it being like regularly updated and engaged with it's just kind of sitting there um, as as it as it was I do know that um, I've, I've mentioned contextual collecting if there is kind of I suppose other channels where the, the audience interact um it, it's kind of how then archives and libraries may want to collect that we we can't collect closed forums in the web archive we can't collect anything that's kind of behind passwords um so so they, they, there's an awful lot of this kind of going on sometimes and and that's not in web archives so if any researchers are researching this afterwards um you can't you can't kind of find discussion forums that were behind passwords in in the web archive um yeah Sorry, again, I've got more questions than answers with this one, um, but I think I think if anyone's creating a work like this with audience engagement and they might need to think of a kind of maybe a kind of exit strategy or what or what what do they do to either let an audience know when a work is ending or have a plan for how it does continue and who looks after that afterwards. Yeah. I agree. I think it's, it's a similar point. Yeah, there's it's sort of building some kind of strategy around archiving into into any launch online is, is probably really essential. Fanzines, those kind of things are great because they do keep stuff live. But, you know, the Internet is a place where, you know, it, it looks for new activity and new sensation. I also think that a lot of this stuff has just developed um, and iterated so fast. So inevitably, I think there has been more churn and kind of people moving on to on to the next thing and the next thing. And maybe, you know, as as quality thresholds and standards and things perhaps begin to converge a bit more, um, you will see things that have more kind of inbuilt legacy to them but but it's tricky because without yes yeah, some either either that kind of fan based um approach to keeping things live yeah inevitably these things fall fall down that fall down the lists pretty quickly and without spending a lot of money optimizing them again that, that they will sort of yeah they will go into the past Thank you all so much. Um, I have learned so much from the conversation today. Uh, and thank you to the audience for all of the great questions. I think, I actually think it's a good sign that we have um, lots and lots of questions, even if we don't have answers, because I suppose the only way to work through what's going on and closer towards answers is to, to keep talking about these things. Um, and I'm so grateful to Margaret, Fiona and Stella for coming and, and giving us uh, some of their time so that we can draw on their expertise and understand more about how people in their industries are thinking through these questions, the issues that are kind of really burning and pressing for them. Um, so thank you so much, a huge round of applause for you. And I can see comments and thank yous pouring into the chat. Um, a final quick reminder for everyone, uh, for those of you who are working on these areas yourself, whether that's as um, an academic, a creative practitioner, a teacher who's thinking about how to use works like these in class, if you're interested in sharing some of that work, think about putting forward an abstract for our conference. So I've just put the CFP back into the chat. Um, uh, we're hoping to get our abstracts in at the start of June, but if you're interested and need a little bit more time, I think that that should be fine. Um, and also uh, to let everyone know that our fifth and final event will be happening on the 20th of June. It is going to explore mixed realities and intermedia, um, a lot of it thinking about different kinds of hybrid creativity and practices. So I think it'll carry on in really interesting ways from a lot of the questions raised today. I've put the Eventbrite um, registration page in the chat there. So great to see everyone. Final thing is just to say that for participants, a little survey will pop up at the end of this call asking you for a bit of feedback and also asking if you're a teacher or artist, if you might be interested in talking at our event in July. Thank you so much and take care. Bye-bye.